If you're like me, you've read or heard of reports and news accounts talking about the negative consequences of producing beef, with greenhouse gas emissions, heavy water use, and the welfare of animals leading the list of concerns. But just when it seems like producing and consuming less beef might be a health and environmental bonanza, along comes an alternative way of doing things, one that uses a fundamentally different approach to things. I'm Kelly Brownell, director of the World Food Policy Center at Duke University and professor of public policy at Duke. Nancy Ranny manages the Ranny Ranch in Corona, New Mexico. In 2003, she began a restorative grazing plan based on planned rotational grazing and started the Ranny Ranch grass-fed beef program and is committed to running the ranch on the soundest, most humane, and most ecologically resilient principles. Nancy works with Melvin Johnson, ranch manager, to develop grazing plans and conservation programs. She also coordinates ranch workshops and retreats. She is on the board of the Quibira Coalition and is president of the Southwest Grass-Fed Livestock Alliance. Nancy has a master's degree in landscape architecture from Harvard University and a background in land planning. Nancy, I really appreciate you joining us. I first learned of your work through your husband, David Levy. He was dean of the Duke Law School at the same time I was dean of the School of Public Policy at Duke, and he mentioned the innovative work you were doing with your family ranch in New Mexico. And then when I looked into it, I found out just how innovative your approach is and how you were ahead of your time. So you do regenerative agriculture. Can you explain what this means? Thank you, Kelly. I very much appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. Regenerative agriculture refers to those land management practices which build soil health, increase biodiversity, improve water cycles, and generally build nutrient density in soil. Keywords are regenerate, meaning bringing new life and vigor, and resilience, that capacity to survive and flourish even in difficult conditions. And of course, these such practices do increase the productivity on the land and hence economic production. In my own world of ranching, generally these regenerative practices are linked to grazing practices on the land. And these do promote resilience and build soil and biodiversity. We have seen this happen over the past 18 years. And interestingly, very much so during a period of deep drought in the Southwest from the mid 90s to 2012 in New Mexico. These practices are known variously as short duration, high intensity rotational grazing. Another term is adaptive multi-paddock grazing also holistic managed grazing, and perhaps my favorite, poop and stomp. They, <laughs> all, they promote nutrient cycling in the soil, but the real key is, that, is the need to have a grazing animal, and in the West, that's the cow, to reinvigorate the landscape. So Nancy, explain how it works. So you know, I've seen pictures of your land, and it's beautiful and lush and rich, and right next to it is land that looks like complete desert. I mean, nothing, you can't imagine anything growing. So what happens that, that makes this cycle occur? What do you actually do? Well, the, the key was the, a shift in management from continuous grazing. And most of the West has been grazed continuously. That means animals on the land all the time. And that's a very conventional approach. When I took over the ranch, when my family started managing it after my father died in 2002, the big shift was from running 18 herds in 18 pastures to condensing down to one herd. Now we move one herd across our ranch, across 34 pastures as we've subdivided some of those pastures to get better usage. And it means that they are on the land, on each pasture for a much shorter period of time, and that those grasses then have a chance to recover. A minimum of six months, sometimes up to a year or even more. And we have seen remarkable recovery with that change. So as I understand the 
the cow's hooves uh, churn the soil. That allows the soil to retain water better. The grasses grow. The animals fertilize the soil, and you get this nice cycle going. But my, my knowledge about this is pretty naive. Is that kind of how it works? That's really basically how it works. Um, what's interesting is that uh, there is a, an incredible seed bank in the soil. And this is true really across the country and particularly in the semi-arid west that these seeds can survive for over a hundred years. And what we have discovered is that with this with this new form of grazing, with absolutely no artificial seeding, no extra fertilization than from the cows, no irrigation, we have seen the emergence of uh, of seeds that were in the ground, we had no idea. We went from a monoculture, a very nice grass, blue gramma grass, uh, very palatable and healthy for the animals, nonetheless a monoculture. Now we have close to 50 native grasses that have emerged. So if you began this process on some acreage next to yours that now doesn't look like much of anything could grow, would there be grasses that are there lying dormant that, that would then take root and become like your property if you began this process? Yes, there would definitely be. How is this good for the environment? Well, in many ways. Any biodiversity is excellent for creating resilience and productivity, really in all landscapes. What, what we have seen is uh, hot, much higher organic content in our soils, greater potential for permeability of the rainfall, uh, water storage, healthier root systems of our grasses. Are, we, when, we, when we dig into our soils, we see that our roots go down 30 inches into the soil compared to two on our neighbors, and significantly increased soil organic carbon. In five years of this pasture management, we saw an increase of 25% increase in soil just on our ranch. Also, they well, cool the soil temperatures, which inevitably cool the air temperatures. So when you mention the, the carbon in the soil, mm -hmm. I, I, from what I understand, the, uh, the, the grasses sequester carbon into the soil and that helps offset the uh, effect on greenhouse gas emissions cattle might otherwise have, is that right? That's correct. It's actually, um, the grasses are the conduit and the soil is, the carbon is actually stored in the soil itself. Um, but what has been found and increasingly, and this is really just in the last 10 years that there has have been more focused scientific analysis of what's going on here. There have been people talking about this for decades, but really most of the work has dis been dismissed as anecdotal. But just recently, um, there's new evidence which really documents how much carbon has been. And I can I have a few figures here if you're interested in them. Um, By all means. It's, it's impressive. The, this form of grazing um, accrues 1.4 to 2.4 tons of carbon per hectare per year over that accrued by continuous grazing. In fact, continuous grazing generally releases carbon into the atmosphere. And interestingly, it also is able to sequester the methane that is produced by cows grazing on the land. One might often one might wonder why during the early, early or centuries here in our own country with the vast herds of bison, why we weren't uh, releasing more methane as a greenhouse gas, which, which as far as scientists can tell did not happen with many more grazing animals than we have today. And um, that is because the methane actually is real-time sequestered in the soil when animals are out on grassland. What is the, the history of how this model developed? Well, it's an age-old pattern on the ground, an age-old model. As I mentioned, the, um, the herds of bison in this country and the great migrating herds in sub-Saharan Africa moved across the land in just this fashion, and they were responding to 
uh, seasonal variation, gro grass growth cycles, and importantly, the action of predators who keep herds moving. In the 1950s and 60s, a young game biologist working in what was then called Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, Alan Savory, noticed some of these patterns. And at that time, interestingly, as a game warden, he was, he, his uh, project was to limit, reduce the herds of elephants uh, in Rhodesia because they were seen as so destruct destructive. But what he noticed was that where animals were allowed to move, to migrate, um, the numbers were not the problem. It was the amount of time that they stayed in any one place, and that was destructive to the environment. So he developed over the years this approach, which he calls holistic planned grazing, which is essentially what we are doing on the ranch, a grazing model that mimics nature and if done well, can reverse these really negative processes on the ground. You know, for our listeners who might be interested in learning more about that history, I know that Alan Savory has a TED Talk on this that's really quite good that I've listened to. But let me ask you another question. I know that you're in interested in the intersection of soil health and human well-being. Can you explain this? Well, yes, I'm really fascinated by this. And obviously, I'm not a soil scientist or a a food scientist, but what I've seen over the last number of years is this really interesting intersection between soil health, our the health of our food, and our own health of the, our own human gut, the microbiome. And I, it seems almost every week I read an article about new discoveries of what's going on in, the, in our mi microbiome and how important it is that we feed this in uh, significant ways. And that all starts with having healthy microorganisms in the soil, which is what we're seeing right here on the ground. Are there standards for best practices for this regenerative approach? And are there things like certifications? Well, that's a difficult question. We need lots of attention in this area. Currently, there are no federal standards for, for these regenerative practices, for grass-fed production, and or for healthy, healthy livestock products. Increasingly, our agricultural agencies and land-grant universities are seeing that such approaches are helpful to both to land health and to meat health and increasingly recommend these practices. There are elective certifications, and for those who are interested, they, they can look these up. Our ranch, for example, has three certifications. One is with the American Grass-Fed Association. Um, we, have a, we have an annual visit with, by an independent certifier, and you are certified if you are a domestic USA producer using only grass and forage and no antibiotics or growth hormones. We also have a certification with animal welfare approved, administered by a greener world. This is an independent nonprofit and Consumer Reports rates it as the really the best indication of animal welfare if you're if you're interested in looking for that. And most recently, we have a certification with the Audubon Conservation Ranching Program. We're certified, our beef is certified as grazed on bird-friendly land. And this focuses on healthy land management practices that encourage biodiversity and grassland bird habitat. Would consumers notice differences in taste of the, the meat products that are produced this way versus conventional agriculture? Well, interestingly, meat products are very much like wine, and there is a terroir uh, associated with different products. So we will notice different tastes and textures between products all across the country. You will see that in general, grass-fed product is leaner than what is produced from our conventional grain-fed system, leaner and more tender. And in the early years of grass fed, um, there was a, I think it developed a reputation of being tough. And 
I believe that that was because people didn't know how tender it was and cooked it the same amount of time as they were cooking conventional beef. It really only requires about half the amount of time. We market our beef as very young. This is not veal, but it is young beef, so it's particularly uh, tender, and um, we're very proud of that. And are you hopeful about how things look with future generations of farmers and ranchers? I'm very hopeful. I'm really thrilled, actually. I want to recognize this cadre of young people who are joining the world of agriculture. This includes farmers, ranchers, processors, and marketers of healthy products. And I think it's precisely because they recognize agriculture as an entry into dealing with our environmental health and our human health and even their own personal health. There are some truly wonderful, beautiful writers among these young agrarians. And I think maybe it's because in our crazy world, they have a contemplative, contemplative space to think about relationship and, and write about it. Um, we have a, uh, I've been for many years on the board of the Kavira Coalition, which offers an apprenticeship program for young people coming into agriculture, both farming and ranching. We've had three apprentices at our ranch and just wonderful people from all across the country. Uh, my sense is if anyone can heal our environment, it will be this next generation. They understand good land management and they're also are very committed to developing the relational skills that we need to make all these things successful. Well, Nancy, you have an impressive story to tell, and I'm really grateful you were able to share it with us today. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Kelly. Our guest has been Nancy Ranny from the Ranny Ranch in Corona, New Mexico. Thank you to our listeners. Please subscribe to the Leading Voices in Food at Google Play, Stitcher, Radio Public, or Apple Podcasts, or by visiting the website of the Duke World Food Policy Center. This is Kelly Brownell.